to the Quiet Happiness Knits YouTube channel. My name is Emily and in my videos I talk all about what I am making, which is usually knitting, sometimes some other crafts thrown in there. I talk about my love of yarn and wool and just what I am loving lately. Thank you so much for stopping by, whether you are a new viewer or if you've been here for a while, thank you so much. Um, you can find links to everything that I mentioned, all the patterns and everything in the description box down below. And you can find me on Instagram at Quiet Happiness Knits and on Ravelry I am Emily Ruth B. Wow, I think I actually like said the, the, the all the introduction stuff. Normally I forget most of that. And it has been a while, so... Thank you for sticking around. Thank you for being here. Um, I was, I had been hoping to film outside, which is what I usually do, but I live in Maine and we had our first frost overnight. <laughs> and so it was very chilly. I also have a ton of stuff to show you and it was just going to be a lot of work to bring it all outside. So we are here in front of my pegboard yarn wall, which I hope is an appropriate substitute <laughs> for the woods and yeah let's jump right in I have some finished objects a few works in progress that I'm going to talk about knitting related I have a finished sewing project and then I do have my purchases from the 2021 New York Sheep and Wool Festival which I was lucky enough to be able to attend this year and so I will save that stuff for the end in case you don't care in case you already have enough FOMO related to Rhinebeck and you'd just rather not which I have definitely I've like two years ago when like I thought had thought about going didn't end up going and I just like I would see people's posts and just get so sad that I hadn't been able to be there so I totally get it so that will be at the end Except for, I've got a few like finished objects that I'll talk about that I wore there. But yeah. So, oh, and I am currently wearing, I don't know how to say the name, but I, in my head, I say it as Bravura Pullover by Beatrice Perrin Dolan. It is a Colorwork Yoke DK weight sweater. And you won't be able to see it because I'm sitting down. Um, but I'm also wearing a skirt that I sewed. It is a gypsum skirt by So Liberated. I've talked about it in a previous video. So let us jump right in. So I, there's been other projects I finished because it's been a while since I last uploaded a video, but I just picked a few things that I really wanted to talk more in depth about for this video today. So first up is a test knit that I did this fall for Emma of Bloom and Create. This is her Mountain Mama hat. So Emma had released a sock pattern called the Mountain Mama socks that I had made when that, when that pattern came out. And then she wanted, then she did a DK weight pattern of the same Mountain Mama pattern, but DK weight socks. And then she released this fall a hat in DK weight yarn that is the Mountain Mama hat. And so I was a test knitter for this. There are a few size options. There are also a couple of brim options. Emma includes instructions both for a traditional ribbed brim 
and also for a folded brim, which is what I opted to use. I have only done a folded brim maybe once or twice before, but I forgot how much I love the way it looks. I like the way it fits. I tend to prefer a slightly looser fitting hat. Not looser fitting, but just a bigger hat because my hair, my hair texture is just very like slippery. And so I put a hat on and it just like if it's too tight, it will, or even if just the ribbing is too tight, it will just slowly creep back on my head and stops keeping my head warm. And like I said earlier, I live in Maine, we need warm hats. So I went for the folded brim in one of the larger sizes. And Emma also includes some notes if you wanted to add more stockinette stitch to the portion above the color work before you start the decreases. I did not do that. I, for whatever reason, I knit color work relatively loosely. I know that a lot of people will sometimes go up a needle size if they're doing a project that has color work and stockinette, they'll like go up a needle size for the color work portion. But I have found that I knit color work as loosely as I do stockinette, sometimes even more loosely. So I did not need to add any rows to the top to make it a little bit more slouchy. So I love this hat. And the yarn I used is Explorer Knits and Fibers in, I believe this is, this is the colorway linen and this is the colorway golden snitch. And I had bought this yarn back in the beginning of the year at some point, maybe in the ugh, December last year, I don't know. I had it for a while, um, but I support Emma of Bloom and Create on Patreon and she had kind of posted a sneak peek of the beginnings of this design back several months ago. And so I knew I had these two skeins of yarn that I bought to do something in color work. And so I set them aside. I made sure that I saved them for whenever this hat came out. So even if I hadn't tested it, I was going to knit it at some point. So this, yeah, so this is my finished Mountain Mama hat. And once I was done with the hat, I still had a decent amount of my two skeins of yarn left. I think I had maybe 30 grams of the of this golden color left. I probably I would have had more if I had done a ribbed brim instead of the folded brim. I would have had more left. And then I had I think about 60 grams of the linen color left. So I had been wanting to knit the DK weight version of the Mountain Mama socks for a while anyway. And so I decided to use my leftover yarn and make a matching pair of socks. So I have finished one and I have just turned the heel of the other sock. And so you can see that on the socks there are the mountain peaks on the top and then you go into a solid color for the rest of the sock. Now the fingering weight version include the pattern is written to have three colors and only one row of mountain peaks. This one adds a second, oh maybe it has two mountain peaks. Now I'm doubting myself. But either way, the fingering weight version is written for three colors. The DK weight version is written for two colors. And the pattern has you using this main color all the way down to the toe. But I wanted to have the main section of my socks be the gold color, but I didn't have enough to do the entire foot in gold. So I did the toe and I did maybe five or six rounds in linen before I started the toe decreases because what I did to make sure I would have enough yarn, I split the the golden yarn in half. I have I just have a little kitchen scale that I use if I ever need to weigh yarn or fiber or anything. So I split my ball of yarn in half so that I knew that I could just knit my first sock until I ran out of the golden color and then switch to the linen and I knew that I would have, be able to get it to match on the second sock because I had split my ball of yarn in half. So yes, these work up so quickly. If you have never made DK weight socks, and I, I don't think I have, these knit up incredibly quickly. I knit all of this earlier today over the span of just maybe a couple of hours. I knit all the color work and turned the heel. So if you would like a quick project, I highly recommend DK Wade socks. 
I know Emma has these ones. Um, Natasha of Northern Knits and Pearl also has a few DK weight stock patterns I have my eye on. So highly recommend. And I'm excited to be able to have, hopefully soon, a matching hat and sock set. So that is my, my little Mountain Mama duo of projects. And while we're talking about sock works in progress and patterns by Emma of Bloom and Create, <laughs> I will talk about my other, they're almost done, literally almost done, my other sock whip right now are the Intertwined Socks by Emma of Bloom and Create. When I say I'm almost done, um, I just need to kitchener stitch the toe. I was visiting a friend the other day and we were watching a TV show and I finished my sock but I didn't have um, like my notions bag or anything with me to do the kitchener stitch. So these are a beautiful pattern. Again, it is a, like the Mountain Mama socks, color work on the leg. I am using a sock set from Woolberry Fiber Co. This is her Emma sock set based on the character and book by Jane Austen, which I love. I'm telling you, if there's a literary connection to yarns and projects, I just get pulled in. I love it. It's my favorite thing. So it is this beautiful blush pink color with speckles of uh, kind of a red, some orange, a bit of brown mixed in, and then the contrast is this beautiful, like, honey brown, warm brown color. And this is, it, they look gorgeous, but the color work pattern is actually relatively simple. The Mountain Mama socks, I actually have to pay a bit more attention because some of the floats are longer, some of the color work sections are longer. But these are actually relatively simple. There are several rows in the center here where you're doing the same thing for multiple rounds. And so I have just really enjoyed these. This was my work on Well at Rhinebeck project. I actually kitchener stitched this toe while in line on Sunday morning to get into the fairgrounds. So these were, it was fun to be able to knit on these while I was meeting Emma because Emma was also at Rhinebeck. Anyway, so they have a partridge, it's just a partridge heel, slip stitch heel, because in traditional socks, the if you're doing a slip stitch heel, you just do slip one, knit one on all of your right side rows, and then you get those columns of slip stitches. This pattern you're alternating, so you do a slip one, knit one, and then the next right side row is knit one, slip one. So you end up with just this beautiful heel, which I love the first type of heel flap I learned how to knit. So I'm very partial to it. So I am loving these. I just need to do the Kitchener stitch on this toe. And then I will have a beautiful new pair of socks for the fall. And since I have a job where I am going into the office some days a week, but I have kind of chosen to continue to work from home a couple days a week. I like working from home. Um, so I wear more hand-knit socks just because I get too warm in the office if I have full socks on all the time, but I love being able to wear them from home. Okay, I just went, I had to adjust my, my curtain height. <laughs> the window that's right directly to my left gets direct like midday sun, um, but we're at kind of early afternoon, so the sun is moving. <laughs> so I apologize if the lighting is a little hit or miss, but here we are. So those are the only works in progress, really, I think, that I'm going to talk about. So now we will move on to a few uh, finished objects. First up, this is the Foxtails hat by the Petite Knitter. Um, there are two, there's a knitwear designer who goes by Petite Knits, and then there, but this is the Petite Knitter who does the most gorgeous color work patterns. Oh my goodness. She also has a sock pattern that is also a foxtails sock pattern that I'm that I've been eyeing as well. And this pattern I knit because my um, I'm part of like a virtual. I've joined this virtual Young Knitters Knit Night, and um, hosted by Emma Bloom and Create. Apparently, this is the this is the Emma podcast now. Um, that started during. 
as the as the internet will sometimes say the panini and so several of us were going to be at Rhinebeck and we decided to make the same hat pattern and we all picked our own colors um but I had just finished the Mountain Mama test knit the, the hat and I really love the folded brim so this pattern is just written with a ribbed brim but I really really love the stockinette folded brim and this pattern does call for a ribbed brim but it calls for like a ribbed folded brim so I just changed it to a stockinette stitch folded brim and then upon the suggestion of a couple of the other people in the group who had already knit this and said that it was very it was kind of small I added an extra chevron row one of my other friends added a chevron row but did it in a different color I just did two of two purple chevrons instead of one and that kind of gave me again I knit color work loosely so that helps um, but that extra chevron just gave me that little bit of extra space I needed to make this just a really nice snugly fitted hat so yes I'm so happy with it and I think the ribbed brim helps it to not constrict and not slide back as much so, like I can pull it down this far and it's not really going to be moving around a whole lot it just stays right where I, where I would like it to stay to keep you warm <laughs> So this is my foxtails hat and we actually, I know I said I was going to talk about Ryan back at the end, but what I, I guess apparently what I meant was talk about my acquisitions at the end. Um, we actually, so we all wore our hats on Saturday and we get to talk to Christy Glass of Christy Glass Knits about our hats for her tell me about your Ryan sweater video. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, a couple of my friends have watched it. And I haven't had time to see it yet, but um, if you watch it, be on the lookout for our group and our foxtails hats. And I knit, and I knit this out of the same colors that I knit my Rhinebeck sweater in. I believe I had talked about this sweater a little bit in my last video. I think I had started it. So, this is the Yoki Doki by Gudrun Johnston and it is beautiful just beautiful I love it so much and it is a top-down color work yoke and then there are some short rows at the bottom it's hard to see while I'm just holding it up but there's short rows on the bottom at the back to make it a little bit of a swooped hem and the pattern includes options for regular sleeves or bell sleeves and I went for the bell sleeves I had never knit like bell or balloon sleeves before but I love how these turned out and they're not as they don't get in the way I think it helps that you do decreases right at the very end and pull it in and do ribbing so they're not flaring out at the wrists which I think has helped helps them to feel more fancy and be very fun a fun touch without getting in the way which I feel like would happen if I had like if there were flared sleeves and so this is corrugated ribbing at the uh, the at the on the hems of the sleeves and the neck band and the bottom of the sweater and it the pattern doesn't originally call for it on the bottom on the hem of the sweater but I really liked how it looked and I decided to add it in. Um, so corrugated ribbing is when you do your, your knit columns in one color and your purl columns in another color. So in this case, the purl columns are in the my, my dark purple, my main color, and then there are two rows, each of three different colors in my knit column, using the same colors in the rest of the color work yoke. And it's just a really beautiful way to incorporate color, maybe if you're not doing color work, to incorporate some color into your sweater or project. And it's also just a really beautiful way to pull those colors into other parts of a color work sweater. I just, the yoke, I love this yoke. And I did actually get to meet the designer. Gudrun Johnston was signing her, signing copies of her newest book in at Rhyme Deck. And so I went right over. <laughs> First thing when I got there Saturday morning, I went right over to 
the book stands, the, or the book tables, and bought her new book and signed it and showed her my sweater. So this is knit with the same colors as the hat. Now obviously the hat features this lighter color more as the main color, um, but it is all the same colors. So that was my, oh, so that, so this was what my day one Rhinebeck sweater. Um, so after I had knit the sweater and then I had started working on my hat, I was kind of thinking, since I've been a bit more into sewing this year, I got to thinking that maybe I could make something that matched my sweater. So I have made a couple versions of the gypsum skirt by Sew Liberated. And there are two views in that pattern. One of them features side panels with some flared side pockets that stand out from the skirt. And then there's a view that has just regular inseam inset pockets. So I had made two of the versions with the side panel pockets. Um, but then I, and so I decided that because I already had the pattern, I had made it before, that I would make a version of that skirt to match this sweater. Now, because of the length of this sweater, the, the ones with the flared pockets look good with cropped or tucked in sweaters and tops. Um, but this sweater is not cropped and it does flare out a bit at the bottom. Um, and so I decided to go with the view with the inset pockets. Um, and I purchased some Ex Essex, I forget, there's a few different linens. Um, that are Essex linen. Some of them are yarn dyed, some of them are not. And, but they're all, they're at a lower price point and I love their linen rayon blend. It's what I had made my other gypsum skirts in. Um, and so I decided that I would go with, I did some looking around for fabrics and they had this color uh, that matched my sweater. Now forgive me, it is wrinkled because I washed it after I got back from Rhinebeck recently. Or I, I get back from a trip. Um, my sister and I went to Rhinebeck, spent a few days in New York City. Um, so I have washed it. I have not ironed it. This was a little wrinkly. Um, but this is my third gypsum skirt. So you can see it has, if you know anything about the pattern, obviously this does not have those flared out pockets. It has regular inseam pockets, but it still has the same. I love this waistband. Um, I love elastic waist everything, honestly. And so you get it. It's a two inch elastic that you use for the waistband. And I just, I love it. Um, if you have never made this skirt and you are like myself, relatively new to sewing, I would recommend doing this one first. If you want to make the skirt doing this view before you do the pocket one, not necessarily because of the flared out pockets, but because on the side panel version, you have to do flat felled seams, which are just an extra challenge and can be fiddly. And I definitely messed up on one of them. Um, so this one just has regular seams. So I would highly recommend if you're going to start with this skirt pattern, just actually start with this version. So this is... I kind of, I wanted to pull out a bit more of the orange color, but have it still be something that I know I'll wear, not just with this sweater. So I loved how these look together. I will insert a picture of the whole outfit so you can see it. So this was my Ryan Beck Day 1 outfit. Um, you'll notice I do not mention hand it socks because it was very warm that day and I wear flip flops. So. <laughs> It is what it is. So that is one sweater that I have finished. I have another finished sweater. So that sweater is knit in fingering weight yarn. I finished that one like a month before ride bag. I had it ready. And then I cast on another sweater in a DK weight yarn and I I was kind of in the back of my mind thinking that if I get it done in time, I would bring it. If not, I've knit other sweaters and tops this year. I would have something to wear. <laughs> um, I'm not in any danger of running out of hand knit sweaters. But then I got it done in time. 
So this is the Favorite Flannel by Alicia Plummer. The yarn is Sunday Fiber Co. in her DK Weight base in her Dusk colorway, which I have knit a pair of socks and I love. So this pattern is a top-down raglan construction and it features this beautiful slightly textured stitch pattern which was perfect it was mindless but a little still a little bit interesting so i had purchased four skeins of dk weight yarn from elise and i don't remember it was some kind of sale or she was selling some like one of a kind or something i don't remember what it was but i had bought there were only four skeins but I bought them knowing that that would probably be enough to either knit a super big comfy shawl or a cropped sweater. Um, and so what I did was I started the sweater. I knit a little bit down past where I separated for the sleeves. And then I went back, knit the neckband, knit both sleeves, and then I finished the body. Um, that way I could knit the sleeves to the length I wanted and then um, kind of figure out the body length from there. I I can, like, I don't mind wearing, I've kind of gotten more into cropped sweaters recently. And so I knew that if it ended up more being cropped at my natural waist, that it would still look good with the high-waisted skirts that I've been making and buying the past few years. And that if it was a little bit longer, then I could still wear it with those skirts, wear it over dresses, wear it with slightly higher-waisted pants, whatever. So I was more concerned about having, like, I didn't want it to be short sleeved, basically. So I knit these to be three quarter length sleeves. So they hit me like just about right here, maybe a little bit farther down. Um, so I'm really happy that I did it that way because then I had the sleeve length I wanted and it does hit just around, like just past my belly button area, which is perfect for wearing with my gypsum skirts, which, is what I paired it with for day two of Rhinebeck. It is a gray gypsum skirt that I had previously made. So this is, and the yarn is just delightfully soft. Now this is a non-superwash yarn and this sweater got some heavy use because I wore it all day at Rhinebeck and then I wore it um, one of the days that my sister and I were in New York City and we walked a lot. We walked 26 miles over two days. <laughs> um, so I wore this for part of the day, like the second half of the day, one of those days and so it got a lot of heavy use right away and so the armpits have kind of felt it a little bit which is totally fine and it has happened on other sweaters that I have knit um particularly with non-superwash yarns you're just you're getting a lot of friction right there um and I, I don't mind that it makes me less afraid that like I'm gonna get a hole in the armpit which has also happened on some sweaters um where it will just kind of a stitch will pop or it just gets stretched out um because that is just an area that gets a lot of friction in a sweater. And so, yeah, but I love that it's already so, like, worn in. I love it. And I didn't actually have a chance to block this before, uh, before I left. So I didn't have, well, I had a couple of days where I could have blocked it, but I just didn't know that it would have time to dry because it's a DK weight base. It's not fingering weight. So I didn't want to take the risk. So it fit really well. It's not a stitch pattern that, like, that needs to be blocked. It's not color work or lace or anything. So it looked totally fine. Nobody could tell. So this is the Favorite Flannel by Alicia Palmer. So I think, I wanna make sure I didn't have anything else that I wanted to mention. No, I think, I think that's it. I guess I can briefly mention, I have been doing a little bit of spinning lately. I bought some fiber at Rhinebeck and I hadn't been spinning as much the last few months, but I bought some fiber so it kind of, um, once I got home, I wanted to pull out my little electric wheel that I have. It's just a little tiny electric wheel. And so I'm kind of spinning up some of the fiber that I already owned before I break into my Rhinebeck purchased fiber. Um, I've had some of this fiber that I've been working on for a while. Actually, the ones I spun are farther up there. <laughs> Across the room. I won't go get them. But this is a, a BFL fiber from Wild Artisan, Wild Lily Artisan Fibers. 
And so I finished up this. I need to wash the last couple of skeins that I finished spinning up this week. Um, so yeah, so this is a beautiful, beautiful fiber. And I'm excited to use it in something. We will see. I have yet to knit with any of my hand spun. I should probably do that just to see, you know, how it knits up to see if that can inform how I spin. I don't, I'm just basically spinning as a relaxation technique. <laughs> I'm not really focusing a whole lot on techniques or on learning different methods right now. I think I will explore that with a few of the different uh, sheep breed specific fibers I bought at Rhinebeck. Um, but for right now, I think what I'm, I'm doing like a short draft, because um, basically I learned how to spin on the drop spindle. And then I get this little electric wheel. I think it helps that I'm not treadling because it's electric. It's got a, like a little knob you turn on to adjust the speed. Um, so I think that has helped, but I basically just moved my drop spindling, how I learned how to do that in a class, to my electric wheel. I'm just kind of figuring it out as I go. Um, right now, right now I am working on spinning this braid of fiber and this is from Knitcraft and Knittery and it is, I don't know how to say this, Swallowdale wool, Swale tail. It was not a breed I had heard of which is exactly why I bought it and the, I'm going to say Swaledale. The Swaledale sheep is a breed of domestic sheep named after the Yorkshire Valley of Swaledale in England. They are found throughout the more mountainous regions of Great Britain. And so this was, again, this was not, not something I'd heard of before. I haven't done a deep dive or anything on the type of fiber, but it is a, um, the Swaledale Sheep Breed Association website <laughs> describes the wool as white with a thick deep bed and a curly top medium length not coarse so it's i would def like it's definitely a bit more coarse than like a merino but i find it hard to compare merino is a fiber that a lot of hand spinners and knitters are acquainted with it's what a lot of yarns are made out of it's what you get in a lot of hand dyed yarns um but it's also like, but that's because it is one of the softest breeds of wool. Um, but there are so many breeds of wool that have different characteristics that are amazing and beautiful and wonderful. But describing them as just not as soft as merino is just such a wide, a wide spectrum. But I would say um, if it is a bit more, it's a bit more coarse than the BFL that I have spun with. Uh, if that is any indication, but it's, it spins beautifully. I think that helps as a new spinner because it, it does have a bit more grip to it. So it's not breaking as easily as a more fine wool would as I'm spinning. Um, yes, cause I've spun a couple different braids of BFL fiber and this is a bit, has a bit more of a handle than any of those. So I have a couple bobbins that I just plied the other day, um, and then I will keep on spinning up the singles. Now I'm not doing any sort of like color matching or anything because these tones are so similar. It's some pinks some purples and a little bit of, of orange, but it, they're not super distinct colors because in, in this fiber, they are more distinct colors. So I would kind of split the braid in half and then try to apply them so the colors matched up in some places. Uh, I still definitely got some barber pulling because my spinning is not perfectly even, but I did kind of do a bit of color management on this one, which was the first time I had attempted color management of any kind. I'm not for this. I want to see what it looks like kind of all blended together and um, yeah, just kind of all mixed up. I may attempt to practice doing a more long draft technique. Um, maybe watch, actually watch a few YouTube videos or something before I attempt that. So we'll see. So that is my current spinning project.
So I bought a skein of their new Seadale base. And I bought it in this beautiful purple color. Oh, I love this color. And I hadn't really been looking for worsted weight yarns. It's not a weight that I tend to use a ton of. But I love this base. And they had a sample in their shop uh, booth of a hat pattern that had been written specifically to use this yarn. The pattern is called Seadale. I'm blanking on the designer's name. Um, I just barely cast it on the other night. But it's this beautiful cable hat that uses a single skein of the yarn. So that pushed me over the edge once I knew I would be able to make a cable hat out of it. So I was interested because this base is a blend of Wensleydale and Manx Lofton, which I had never heard of Manx Lofton. And I don't think I've knit with Wensleydale that I can remember. So I was chatting, I, I stopped by their booth on Sunday morning. First thing, it was really quiet, so I was able to chat with Irina for a while, and she was telling me about the Manx Lofton, and it is a rare breed. It's in the UK, and they are sheep that are on the Isle of Man. And it's a breed that for, you know, for its many years, farmers had just been needing to, you know, had been throwing away the wool. There was not a market for it. People were not wanting it. It's a bit more of a coarse blend, uh, coarse feeling wool, and there just wasn't a market for it. Um, but now there's a bit more interest in the breed, so they have flying fibers. They've imported it from the UK, and they've blended it with Wensleydale to get a, um, to get it. It's, it's, real, it's soft. I am excited to, to use this. I use soft relative if you have used a lot of farm yarns. Um, but it is, it is pretty soft. I think it'll make a really nice warm hat. I don't know that I would want something right around my neck with it. Um, just cause necks do tend to be a more sensitive area, but I think it will make a beautiful, beautiful hat. I definitely have knit hats out of yarn that was more rustic and, and a bit more coarse, had a bit more handle to it. So I'm very excited to see how this yarn knits up. So that is my, the one thing that I've cast on so far with a, with a Rhinebeck purchase, obviously just barely. I kind of, I cast it on, um, cause I was excited to cast on with this yarn, but I kind of have put a pause on this until I could finish my intertwined socks and my Mountain Mama socks. Oh, and one more thing I love about my Matter Root bags, you can roll the top down and clip it closed. Um, I had a few friends and I that were in the booth together and none of them had purchased a Matter Root bag before. And so I was showing everybody that this was how much I love this feature. <laughs> So, yeah, I love those bags. Um, oh, I did mention that I bought Gudrun Johnson's newest book in her, this is her Shetland Trader series. Uh, her, her mother, let me make sure I, let me make sure I get this right, um, her mother had a knitwear business called the Shetland Trader. Uh, they lived in Shetland, it's where she was born, and so she ran a knitwear business um, where she sold finished objects, like full sweaters. And so Gudrun has gone back and has found pictures and actual pieces that her mother had sold. and. Her mother used a lot of combinations of Fair Isle and lace, and so her um, her project in these books is to go and find those pieces and to recreate them as knitting patterns. And I I haven't bought any of her other books, but I I love them. I love the look. I love knitting color work. So let's see. I will pull I'll pull up a few pictures of some that I am very interested in knitting. So for example, so this is Vare. So this has a color work yoke and then a kind of a color work like feather and fan lace pattern on the bottom. Um, there's also a version 
that just has a solid color on the bottom of the sweater. Um, and then like Maywick, which features that striped feather and fan pattern. One of the ones that I really love is Boona Berry. Um, which features a solid colored body with balloon sleeves and color work on the bottom of the sleeves. So I just, I love that look. I now apparently want to knit all the balloon sleeves. Um, so that one is definitely going on my list. I also love this and Gugrum is wearing this one. It's like a jumper with this Fair Isle panel here and then Fair Isle pockets. I don't know how often I would wear something like that, but I really love it. And then the one other that I really would love to make is another dress. Um, Elsk and, I don't know how to say that, Hijarda, Hijarda. And they feature, one has Fair Isle and one has this feather and fan pattern in it, but they are dresses or tunics. So there are just some absolutely beautiful patterns in this book. Um, and a few other smaller items. And because I went there first, that was like the first place that I went on Saturday morning, the first 50 people who got a book signed got a free little sample skein of Jameson and Smith Shetland Wool from the Shetland Islands, which I've heard like a ton of people have used, but I have never, I've never bought it, never felt it. So, and of course I was wearing my like dark purple sweater and I had a maroon purse and I bought like the sample that I picked up is a maroon skein. It's funny. I picked it up and she kind of chuckled. was like, oh, she was like, oh, it's funny that you picked that one up and matches. <laughs> So this is my, my first, my first purchase. Continuing my purple theme, um, another vendor that I visited was Bat and Kill Fibers. They have a mill and they run, they have a few different yarn lines that they do and one yarn line that, um, they kind of, they had done work for a dyer and they recently kind of acquired a yarn line called Oysters and Pearls. And this, this stunning, stunning purple color. If you want to hear a little bit more about the mill, Sarah Pomegranate of Yarns and Yinhu, it's an audio podcast. And before Rhinebeck, she interviewed a couple of the people over at Bat and Kill. And so that already kind of piqued my interest. So this is a worsted weight yarn. Um, it is 50% alpaca, 50% Corydale. And it is botanically dyed. It doesn't say, it says violet on it. I don't know if that's, I haven't heard of people dyeing with violets. So that gives maybe the colorway name. It doesn't say what it was dyed with, but it does say that the yarn is grown, spun, and botanically dyed in the US. So I bought this yarn to make a shawl. Um, they have this alpaca Corydale base in a few different yarn weights, which is exciting. I think they also had it in a DK weight, maybe a sport. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. I think the, the alpaca adds just this extra halo and softness to it. Um, and this, which I thought would also make a shawl with some beautiful drape. So I picked up three skeins of this. Right now I am planning on making the Hummelbai Shawl by Fiber Tails. Um, so I am excited to use this. Apparently I had a purple, I had a purple theme going on. Um, the, so the, this and the Seadale were some of the first yarn purchases I made and I had to kind of steer myself away from buying more purple yarn with my other the other vendors I purchased from. Um, I also, and there are so many booths that I went in that I loved their yarn and just, I can't, I couldn't buy all the yarn. Do you, do you see this? I don't need a ton of sweater quantities. Don't you just spend that much money on sweater quantities. <laughs> So anyway, so tons of beautiful vendors. Um, but yeah, 
These are just the ones that I visited and bought from. I also bought yarn from Foster Sheep Farm. And this is a blend of, it's a 50% Romney, 50% Falkland blend. It's a sport weight yarn. And this, I believe this is the natural, it's a natural colorway. They also have, they dye yarn. They have a few yarns that they have dyed with acid dyes and some that are naturally dyed. But this is just the natural gray color. And, um, I bought this, I hadn't been totally sure what I was going to make with this. I did have in mind that this would make a beautiful shawl, but I think what I have decided on is the Eyelet Pullover by Orlain Souch. I, it was featured in one of the editions of Making Magazine, and it is kind of, it's just this really beautiful, it's got a simple texture on top, and I think I should have enough yarn. I will probably do what I did with my favorite flannel sweater, which is do three quarter length sleeves and then finish off the body. That's kind of my method if I am not totally sure on yardage. So I think this will just be a really beautiful, I have a gray cardigan that I wear all the time and I have a worsted weight gray pullover that I wear a lot. And so I just would love to have a gray sweater in my wardrobe that's a little bit more of just an everyday top that I'm not putting over something because I'm cold, but that I can just wear as a top. So I'm excited to use, again, Falkland is new to me. I don't think I've used Romney very often either. So I'm excited to see how these work up. My last yarn purchase um, is this beautiful green. It's funny, I actually, this is a very local to me um, vendor, and I bought from her at a local fiber event a couple years ago. Uh, but I just, I love her yarn. So this is uh, Lana Plante, and she also does natural dyes from uh, her own animals. And so this is a Rambouillet fiber, and it is dyed with chlorophyll. It's fingering weight and it's 500 yards per skein. I have knit, I have knit a one skein shawl out of one of these skeins. Um, and so my current plan, I bought three skeins so that I can do a sweater. Um, I thought I had, I'm not totally decided on what pattern to use for this. Um, I've got a few other sweaters in my queue that I'm going to work on first, but I am excited to have maybe something like springy, a top that I can wear kind of in the spring when I want green things. So yeah, so I am excited to use all of these beautiful yarns. Um, I just, I love them. I love, I love yarn. <laughs> I think that that goes without saying. If you are here, then I'm sure you also, if you're here, I'm sure that you also love yarn like I do. And as much as I love all the yarn and fiber that I purchased, that's one of the biggest things that I enjoyed was just being with other people who love the craft, who love the wool, who love learning all about it. Um, I was able to meet several people that I am Instagram and virtual knit night friends with, meet some new friends and some, you know, some mutual friends. Um, and so it was just, that was the best part was just getting to be around meeting friends in real life, talking with vendors. I found, especially for me, Saturday is a lot. I didn't buy much. I had to make sure that I, you know, took regular breaks. Um, but Sunday was a little bit slower paced, not as busy. So I was able to chat with some more of the vendors. And one of the friends, um, that I was going around and buying fiber with, Tazi, uh, is a relatively new spinner, but she's super interested, has definitely <laughs> studied more, uh, techniques and fiber types than I have. So I was really fun to tag along with her and we got to chatting with some of the vendors and getting advice on how to spin different fibers. 
because um, we were both looking for breed specific wools. So that was that was really fun to get to talk with vendors. There's some fiber that I bought that I get to meet the sheep, like the sheep were in the barn next door. So you can go pet their sheep and then just go over to their farm booth and buy their fiber, either in fiber form or in wool or in like finished product yarn form, which was just, I love, I love that part of the festival. I just love getting to, to meet new friends, to meet friends in real life and to just spend time around people who also just totally love the same things you do. You know, lots of sweater complimenting and outfit complimenting and talking about, oh, what yarn did you use? And all these different things that is just so delightful and so refreshing to get to kind of move that off the screen, whether it's on YouTube or Instagram or wherever, and moving that into a real life context where you can, you can touch the yarn, you can touch people's sweaters, you can hold hats, you can look at things in person, and it's just such a wonderful experience. Um, so yeah, it was an absolute delight. And I eagerly look forward to going again. And if I'm ever there again, and you also want to go, I would love to see you. And I know there are people, <laughs> it was funny scrolling through Instagram, like Sunday afternoon after I left to be like, to see, and I saw, you know, people who were there that maybe I saw, maybe I didn't see them. Um, my family laughed when I said something about how you can spot knitting celebrities, <laughs> but it is kind of fun to, to look around and recognize people and see designers and yarn dyers that maybe you only follow on Instagram and they feel like, like celebrities. <laughs> so that's always fun, even if I don't go up and say hi just to just to see people um I watched a little bit of a fleece to shawl competition they had three spinning guilds who were doing a competition where they take blocks of wool and they hand card them spin them ply them weave them into a shawl and I don't know all the rules of it but you know there are rules about how big the shawl has to be probably something about, I don't know if there are rules about what kind of pattern it needs to have, but it was just so much fun to watch people doing what they love. Some people were dressed up in costumes because it's close to Halloween. And it was just, it was, and we were there a, during part of one of their breaks. And so we talked a little bit with them about the fibers that they were using to do their, do their projects. Um, so that was really fun. And they didn't have any in-person workshops. I hadn't done any in-person workshops when I had the one other time I'd been to Rhinebeck. That's something that I think I would like to look into next time if they have in-person workshops again, uh, just to maybe get a little bit more hands-on experience, do a class of some sort. Um, so I didn't go to any, they run different, you know, animal events and, and shows and things, but I didn't really try to make it to any of those. I was just spending time with my with my friends and doing shopping and sitting and you know eating food while knitting and you know looking at the beautiful autumn leaves so I will hopefully have sprinkled in some of the pictures I took a few videos mostly I took pictures um so I will have sprinkled these some of those in so I hope that you get a little bit of a taste of a beautiful New England autumn in case you've never experienced it I highly recommend, by the way, if you're ever going to visit New England, I highly recommend like late September into October. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Please come. <laughs> um, it's the best time to come, in my opinion. But I just love fall. So, yeah. So that was my, I didn't do like a vlog style anything. Um, but yeah, it was a wonderful time. And I hope that wherever in the world you are, that someday you are able to attend some kind of fiber related yarn knitting event, either in person or virtually, and you get to, to experience some of that. So I will have links to, I think all the vendors I bought from have online shops. 
So I will link to those if you are interested uh, in looking at any of their any of their other products. Um, and I ha if you are interested in uh, like in farm yarns or anything, I would highly recommend looking through the vendor list on the New York Sheep and Wool 2021 vendors list. There are some beautiful, beautiful yarns, and uh, not everybody has websites, but a lot of people do. So if you're interested in that, I know that sometimes that can be something that's hard to find, especially, I mean, like if people are on Etsy, you can do searches for different things on Etsy, but it can sometimes just be hard to find what you're looking for, just on a general Google search. So if you are interested in some farm, like small farm yarns, small mill yarns, I would highly recommend going through that vendor list and checking out. They have all of their uh, like websites and locations of all these places. So you can see where they are, so maybe see if there's any close to you. Um, can I use that as a jumping off point to see who's close to you? There are places, you know, I've lived in Maine for a long time, um, but like I'm not plugged into the farm scene or anything. <laughs> Uh, but there were some vendors that I would see that they were from Maine, and I would make sure that I kind of took note of their name um, so I can look them up now that I'm back in Maine and get to explore some of the places that I didn't know were close to me. So, yeah, I highly recommend going through that list. So I think, I think that's everything that I wanted to talk about. So, I hope that you are having the best October available to you. And until I see you next time, happy making. Bye. Let your heart be light. Let your spirit.